Hello class, welcome to the first uh, lecture of the year. Now I know a lot of you maybe have summer brain and are feeling a little bit uh, like you've forgotten a lot of math. It's okay, we're gonna go slow in the beginning. The way it works is this is a flipped classroom, meaning the lectures are what you watch at home for homework. And then in class, we do the problems together. I think a lot of people are gonna find this a lot more helpful because what happens is people get home, they don't remember uh, the lesson, and they try doing it without anybody there to help them. Instead, now we can have me there with you while you're working on it and the chance to ask questions and get help uh, while it's happening and fix uh, errors before they become habits or you get frustrated because you don't know what to do. So this is the part for you to watch at home and to understand the material and then come to class uh, with uh, a better understanding to be able to do the problems. In each of these, buried somewhere in the episode, there will be a problem that you need to bring solved uh, to class the next day on a half sheet of paper. This is proof that you watch the video and these uh, half sheets are due at the start of the period when you walk in the door. So uh, that's something to look out for. I'll have that uh, pretty obvious in this one, but some other episodes I may have it not so obvious so that you actually have to pay attention. All right, we are starting off with uh, the uh, chapter one that says, where do we ask simple questions and get simple answers? There are all kinds of things in the world that we expect to behave in a uh, neat and orderly way where we ask it one question and get one answer back and maybe you can think of some examples of uh, procedures that you do one thing and expect one answer. My example, first one, is Siri. We all talk to Siri and we ask her uh, one question and we expect to get an answer back of a simple kind. Less obvious, less of a actual verbal question might be a thermometer where you say what temperature is this person, what temperature is this object, and you expect to get back a number that uh, describes the temperature uh, just as you asked for it. And even things like cars uh, are examples of functions out there in the real world where we do one thing, step on the gas pedal to a certain extent, and we expect a certain kind of result. Step on the brake pedal to a certain extent, you expect a certain kind of result. These are all functions that we encounter in the real world, and as human beings, this is how we've built our uh, world, that we have one-to-one -one correspondence between what we do and how things act in a way that's helpful to us. This chapter is the sort of re-entry into math, the remembering of the stuff that you maybe have forgotten this summer, and so we're going to be talking about functions first, and there are going to be four ways that our textbook is going to present functions to us, and we need to be able to uh, deal with any of these four forms. So, as information comes at us, it can take a variety of different formats. We might be seeing graphs somewhere that in the newspaper, uh, online, in the news, you can see a, uh, a graph of information that you should be able to understand information given that way. Uh, there are just plain rows and rows and rows of numbers that when you get on uh, an app called Mint and try to look at your bank account, or when you get on Veracross and look at all your grades, this is just an endless stream of numbers coming at you. Also, uh, there are times when you are given formulas. When somebody says, this is, you want to figure out your tax uh, return, plug in your income into this equation, follow this decision tree, and here's a formula for you to be able to compute your taxes. And lastly, there's just communication from one person to another. The way to get from your house to your friend's house might be given to you verbally, a description of where something is, how to do something, some procedure, these can come at us in just a big stream of words. These four ways that we're describing here about how uh, we get given uh, information correspond to the four ways that we're going to be looking at functions in this chapter. Uh, graphically, you can see where we might have a, a cool pie chart like this or uh, a regular uh, 2D line graph you're probably used to now from Algebra 1 onward. 
uh, there are algebraic equations. Our old friend y equals mx plus b, Pythagoras, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, distance equals rate times time. These are all algebraic formulas given to us in the language of algebra. There are numerical tables where we get given a particular uh, temperature to a volume in a chemistry experiment. We might see just a big long string of numbers and we might be given a verbal definition. These are long sentences in English that describe how something works and we need to come up with an equation that matches the words. So if you look with me at page three in your book, we can see that we are given a description of a kind of function that we might uh, encounter in math. So uh, for example, uh, we might be uh, trying to represent the temperature of uh, coffee uh, after a certain amount of time in a room where the temperature is 20 degrees. The uh, graph that you can see here is one way that that information could come at us. We could be looking at this uh, x and y and trying to figure out what's the function that way. Uh, we might be given a formula where we have x and y uh, just as letters in part of a, an algebraic equation with an equal sign and pluses and exponents and multiplication. Uh, we might be given a bunch of numbers. We might be given x and y at particular points and then told we need to find something uh, later, in between, beforehand, that kind of uh, information. So these are all examples of mathematical models. And you've seen these before. We're just sort of trying to systemize, systematize the information and be able to describe the pieces of uh, functions as you've seen them before. Uh, we, when we look at a mathematical model like this graph here, uh, we're always going to have a dependent variable. The dependent variable is the one that uh, depends on something else. So when you look at uh, the graphs, typically we like to graph the dependent variable as the y. In this case, when you look at this graph here, the temperature depends on the time. So that depending temperature uh, is the dependent variable. It is the one that is not whatever we want it to be. It depends on what time after the beginning you're talking about. The independent variable is the one that you get to pick. At any given moment you could say, well, what happens at time 10? What happens at time 15? What happens at time 20? You can pick the different times. It's independent of anything else, but the temperature is dependent upon it. Typically, we like to graph the independent variable left and right and call that x. The domain is simply uh, what is possible uh, for x, what x values are allowed, and then similar to that is the range. This is asking uh, what y values are allowed. And a couple years ago, my uh, freshman girls that I taught in uh, Algebra 1, they had a, a cute saying that they liked to uh, say. They said, uh, Dixon Roy was a cute little uh, acronym that they came up with. Uh, the D stands for domain, the I stands for input, and the X stands for X. Uh, in the other word, Roy, uh, R stands for range, uh, O stands for output, and Y stands for Y. And this is just a sort of helpful mnemonic trick to say domain is asking about what is possible for X, what is possible for the input, and the uh, range is asking what is possible for the Y. So that might be a helpful way for you to remember that. Uh, Last uh, vocab word here that you might look at is uh, asymptote. You're not responsible yet. We'll probably have to save that for chapter 15, but a, a rigorous definition of an asymptote is coming later. For now, you just need to recognize that you've seen these before. These are lines that we uh, approach but never actually reach. So, armed with all of that kind of vocabulary, all of which should be review for you, we might look at another graph over here of this logistic curve, something that we uh, will discuss in chapter seven, I think it is. But um, you might look at this and uh, try to practice using your vocabulary that we've got 
to describe this. So what is uh, the dependent uh, variable? Well, it's area in meters uh, squared of uh, how much flower coverage there is. Okay. Then we look and we say, well, what is the independent variable? Well, that seems to be labeled time on the uh, x-axis. And so now we can say, what is the domain of this function? Well, as it's given to us, we've got 100 years, 0 to 100, possible for x. And for the range, it seems to be 0, but it doesn't quite seem to get past that 800. So even though the graph goes to 900, we're going to say the range of this logistic curve is 0 to 800. And there seems to be an asymptote, a line that we are getting closer and closer and closer to, but never actually reaching, up there at y equals 800. And it turns out there's actually one down at y equals 0 as well, but maybe that's not quite as obvious. But again, this is just the vocabulary that we need to be able to express uh, some facts about this graph. Now, you can see they also gave it to us uh, algebraically. There's an equation. Uh, there also is a bunch of data that we can look at and see uh, all of these uh, points that we could translate into numerical data. Uh, we can also give this a verbal uh, definition, which uh, looking at the graph seems to be something like um, when you start with a certain number of uh, flowers uh, in a given uh, field or place, uh, over time, they grow to fill the entire 800 square meter area following a logistic curve. So that would be a verbal description of that same function. Now, as you try to do these problems, uh, we're going to need to have some calculator skills in place. Now, we won't be able to play Skyrim on our calculators. I don't know how to make it do that. I don't think anybody does. But you should have some basic uh, skills in place. Uh, we can certainly go over that in class for those who are missing it, but I hope that you know how to find a, how to pick a decent window for your function, how to put a function into the y equals part of uh, your calculator, how to enter data in a table so that uh, uh, the second uh, graph button up there uh, above uh, where the word graph is, if you press second graph, that'll get you to the table to be able to see the numerical data once you've entered a function. If you need to enter the numerical data yourself, then you need to be able to press uh, stat uh, right there and then go into the edit mode and uh, enter a bunch of data yourself. Typically, we like to put uh, x's in L1 and y's in L2. And then if you press uh, second y equals, then you should be able to turn on a stat plot and be able to uh, see the data. Again, very helpful trick is knowing the window to pick, but you can also get the calculator to make a good window for you. If you press uh, zoom uh, and then choice number nine is zoom stat, which will make the window automatically correspond to uh, your statistics, provided that they've been turned on in Statplot. And I will put some more links, I will find some videos about calculators, TI, intro, stuff like this, and put links down below in the description. All right, now, what I would like for you to do as you prepare for class tomorrow is to turn to page uh, four in your uh, textbook and just read aloud example one to yourself. Try to uh, piece together what they're saying to you based off of the information given and uh, that should then allow you to sketch a graph based off this verbal description. What would seem appropriate to match the data. Now, the description is given to you verbally. You could try to guess some numbers that will help make your graph uh, more reasonable, and then looking at what you've drawn, can you come up with an algebraic formula that approximates what you've done? This is a good practice. This is a good way to sort of remember how functions work and how we go back and forth from the world of English to the world of math. Now, what you actually need to come uh, to class with and have done already uh, for class uh, the day the, after you watch this is uh, problem number one on page five. Uh, 
uh, and uh, starting off putting the data from 2A into your calculator. So you need to come with number one done and the data from 2A entered into your calculator. We will then do 2B through 6 in class and that will be uh, the assignment going with this lecture. So hope uh, you have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow. Thanks.